at the end of the day, that's exactly what it is, is you're being served a uh, sweet with a bowl of tea and that's uh, what it is. But around that, of course, is built a complete art form. We say in Japanese, sogo biji to sogo geijitsu, which means a complete art form unto itself. And so every aspect is that uh, the, the connection between a lot of the traditional Japanese arts and the way of tea, how they brought each other up, so to speak. That is tea master Randy Chano Soe. And this is the Ikigai Podcast. Find your Ikigai at ikigaitribe.com. Hello, it's Nick Kemp here from ikigaitribe.com with episode 10 of the Ikigai Podcast. In this episode, I speak with Canadian tea master, Randy Channel Soe. Soe Sensei is a long term resident of Japan and has a deep passion and respect for his art, the way of tea. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Ikigai Podcast. In this episode of the Ikigai Podcast, I am talking with tea master, professor of the Urasenkei tradition, author, and long term resident of Japan, Randy Channel Soe. Soe Sensei is one of only a few foreigners licensed to teach all aspects of Chanoyu, the way of tea. Soe Sensei, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Sensei, you live in Kyoto where you teach the tradition of Urasenkei. So let's start with that. You are a, a chajin, a tea master. So what does that involve as a profession and what is Urasenke. Uh, well, I'll start with your last part. What is Urasenke? Uh, I'm sure many of your viewers are familiar with traditional Japanese culture and arts, uh, from the martial arts to different kinds of like uh, musical plays or even dance, things like that. And each of these traditions will have separate schools or traditions, if you want to call them. And so Urasenke is one of the schools that uh, is uh, responsible for carrying on the way of tea. Um, the Urasenke tradition is by far the largest school of tea in Japan, uh, also the largest internationally as the previous grand tea master, Hoan Sai Dai Sosho, has been traveling over the world for the past 60 years promoting the way of tea and his motto being, uh, in Japanese we say, Ichiwan Kata Peacefulness, which means from peacefulness from through a bowl of tea. Okay. And so um, that uh, part is the blood lineage of the Senke families. There are three families we call the San Senke, and the blood lineage is, stems from Sen no Rikyu. You can maybe see a statue of him behind me there. Yep. <laughs> not I can not going him. to help your audio people. But, <laughs> but um, so the, the traditions, of course, we stem from the same person so our our ideals and philosophies are very much similar it's just kind of i do it with the left hand you do it with the right hand kind of differences but generally speaking we cover the same uh principles of uh and you see in the back on the scroll here it says wake say jack which in in english translates to harmony respect purity and tranquility and so we kind of follow these guidelines as we uh serve uh tea to the various people that we serve it to and then I forget the other parts of your question. That's all right. So the other part was, um, as a profession, as a tea master, as a profession, what, what does that involve? Um, I'll be honest uh, right off the bat is there are very few professional tea teachers. Um, a lot of people will have the license to do it and do it as a hobby, but people that actually make their living from it are very, very few. Um, and so what that entails is, of course, a lot of study to be able to get to the degree that you need to achieve to be able to teach somebody. In my particular case, I came to Japan a very long time ago, and uh, I started just with the martial arts, but uh, I came to Kyoto in 1993 to enter a technical college here that teaches the way of tea. Uh, the technical college is, of course, related to Urasenke, the tradition I follow. And so I went to that school for a three-year course. And then I graduated in uh, 96 and started teaching from that time. And so, of course, there are different ways that you can teach it. But as you mentioned in the introduction, I do teach all facets and 
of it. And so uh, there is a lot of, um, aside from just the knowledge, just the actual practicality of it, or the logistics of it is, is kind of daunting. You need to acquire a large collection of utensils to be able to show all different facets of the way of tea, seasonal uh, things change and stuff like that. So it's, it's um, a never ending process to be perfectly honest or, or uh, a cluttering process. If you would, <laughs> I have a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have. That, that seems to be the way of um, ma- many Japanese um, fine arts. Then uh, there seems to be an end to it. No, I mean, that's actually a good thing to be perfectly honest. We say in Japanese, uh, Kirigenai, there's no end or, uh, the road is long, the back is deep, things like this. Mm. And so um, definitely a lot of the traditional arts have that kind of as a uh, an unspoken philosophy to it, if you would, because it's something that you can do forever, basically, until you pass. It's something that you should continue striving to achieve uh, uh, skill in, if you would. So what I've learned from researching you, Sensei, is that the translation tea ceremony doesn't best describe what Chanoyu represents. So would you like to talk about that? Interestingly enough, uh, probably our school doesn't like to use the term um, tea ceremony. Other schools will use it. And to be perfectly honest, of late, even our schools tend to use it a little bit. It's... um, because everybody knows it is the tea ceremony. Yes. But what we want to avoid is the ceremonial aspect of that. And so it's something that, uh, you know, if the grand tea master or his father does a ceremonial serving in a temple or a shrine or a cathedral even, that is more of a ceremonial style. But what we do in our everyday lives is, as I mentioned before, is to try to put these principles of harmony, respect, and purity and tranquility into balance. And so it's something that shouldn't be really ceremonial. Of course, looking at it from the outside, it might appear to be ceremonial, but uh, the term that I prefer is chanoyu, which just means hot water for tea. But if you take the actual term uh, in Japanese, the majority of people will call it sado. But in our tradition, we prefer to call it chado, like judo, kendo. These are things that that the the terms go together. And so uh, it's something that uh, just trying to bring it into everyday life would be the major point that I would try to say is as far as not being, it's not that ceremonial. It might look it, but when you understand a little bit more about it, then you can see it's, it's more of a, a practical basis. Actually, I did have a, a tea ceremony experience a long time ago. Uh, when I first went to Japan in 95 with my mm-hmm. um, employer. And then on a recent trip, I had a, a far less formal Essentially, it was just someone did make me a a, a beautiful cup of matcha in a a Kyoto garden without Mm. all the – it was actually outside. So in a sense, it wasn't really a um, a way of tea experience, but it still felt – actually, that experience probably was more enjoyable than the first one because I remember the first one (laughs) – all I was thinking about was my sore legs after about yes. <laughs> five minutes of sitting on my knees. Yes. So, um, Actually, go ahead. Yeah, so I do, I do like the way you express that it's, it can be um, a ceremony in the context of perhaps a funeral or um, an important, um, when you're welcoming, welcoming important guests or if there's an occasion, but also it, it is, it is just drinking tea with someone being the host and someone being the guest. Exactly. Mm. At the end of the day, that's exactly what it is. is you're being served a sweet with a bowl of tea and that's uh, what it is. But around that, of course, is built a complete art form. We say in Japanese, sogo bijutsu, sogo geijutsu, which means a complete art form unto itself. And so every aspect, I actually go into it in my book, is that uh, the, the connection between a lot of the dish traditional Japanese arts and the way of tea, how they brought each other up, so to speak. The outdoor serving, I, of course, have no idea what you did, but we do have regular outdoor servings that are called nodate seki, which means outdoor servings, if you would. And they're they're also a a popular way of doing it. And today, you can't see, but I'm not sitting in a Japanese-style tea room. I'm sitting in a Western-style tea room meaning that I'm using a table and chair. We say in Japanese, which means standing bow, uh, but it refers to this table and 
chair style of procedure that was developed in 1872 by the 11th Grand Tea Master of the Yodasenke tradition. And this table was actually developed for the specific purpose of hosting guests from overseas. In 1872 in Kyoto, they hosted a, an international trades fair. It was kind of an agricultural trades or something like that, kind of like a world expo, if you would. And of course, a lot of visiting dignitaries from all over would come and they wouldn't have the proper um, training to be able to sit prop on their knees, much like yourself, five minutes and you're right, good to go. So he developed this style <laughs> using tables and chairs so you can sit comfortably, relatively comfortably. Chairs aren't that comfortable, but you can sit better than on your knees. And to be perfectly honest, the sitting on your knees in Japanese, we refer to that as seiza, mm. which the two kanji broken down mean proper seating. And I'll be honest, that style of uh, sitting is not that historically long in Japan. Probably the last 150, 200 years, maybe prior to that, in like Sen Noriki's time when the, the way of tea was first developing, they were probably sitting more cross-legged, we say in Japanese, agura, or maybe tatehiza, which is kind of the way the warrior class would sit with one knee up to access or to facilitate drawing the sword, if you mm -hmm. would. And so there's those styles of seating were a little bit more prominent. But seiza today, of course, is... is the way that it's mostly done. I understand. I guess there'd be uh, many grateful foreigners who um, can enjoy tea at, at a table rather than it, uh, sitting in Caesar. <laughs> it's not only foreigners. Uh, Caesar's uh, slowly working its way out of Japanese life as well. So it's, uh, uh, I think it depends a lot more on your body type actually than your nationality as to how you, if you can sit for long extended periods of time or not. I know people that just cannot do it at all. Mm -hmm. even like for two or three minutes. So they can't hit the proper. They can sit on their knees, but it's not proper style. So, yeah. But like I said, that works for both Japanese and uh, non-Japanese as well. I see. Now, I've, I've been working on my uh, mobility and flex flexibility. So um, hopefully um, next time I do have a, a, a way of tea experience, I, I can sit in Caesar and, and enjoy it. That would so. be good. Let's discuss your Chame, which is your, your tea master name, which is yes. So, so A. E. Mm. A E, yes, A. So, the name. Uh, what? Yeah, so I was, I was going to ask um, who, who gave you that name and what does it mean? Okay, well, uh, the name was given to me by the previous Grand Tea Master and his son, who is now the 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 current Grand Master. We have an interesting situation today where both the previous Grand Team Master and the current Grand Team Master are living. And so normally what happens is the father will pass away and pass the mantle on to the son. But in this case, our grand, our previous Grand Team Master, actually just last week, he turned 97 years old. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he's still very active going all over the world to promoting the way of tea. Even in his mid to late 90s, I remember a couple of years ago, he was out of Japan 20 times. Wow. Amazing. That's more than I've been out of Japan in 30 years. So it's like, <laughs> wow. Okay. So not a typical 97-year-old or 94-year-old at that time. I don't remember. But uh, at any rate, when you achieve a certain level of tea, you are given a name from the Grand Master. Mine, like I said, was thought of by the two of them. Uh, and it means everybody will receive the first part of the name, which means so. Or which it doesn't mean so. It's, uh, it, I don't like to say the word sect, but it kind of like a sect. Okay. It's, it yep. comes from, from, from the, the Zen temples. And so everybody will have so. So another name for it, we call it a chame, meaning a tea name, or a some. Okay. So, my, so okay. The, the second part is generally for Japanese people, what they will do is they will take one kanji from their name. Like, say, for example, if your name is Amy, they might take so me, and, like beautiful or something, and then they'll put that together. They'll couple it together. But, of course, I didn't have uh a kanji in my name so they selected one for me and uh i was actually thinking they might choose something like ran because my name is randy and diminutively they call me ran chan so ran would have been a good name so ran much easier to write than so a eh? <laughs> and so the uh i was thinking maybe in japanese they have one kanji called mirareru which means chaos and that would have been perfect for me <laughs> but they chose a name that means uh, to glorify, to to go forth and prosper, uh, something like that. It's a, it's a very, very nice name. It was actually the name of the monk that is responsible for bringing tea to Japan in oh, the 12th wow. century. His name is Eisai, so I, I received that name. 
Yeah, I was actually, I was looking up the kanji, kanji characters and, and sort of trying to, to work it out. And, and the soul, you're right, the soul has, you know, has origin or essence or religion or sect. Yes. Or, so that's, that's obviously a name I'm sure you were very happy to receive. I wanted so done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, I guess, of course, I'm very, very honored uh, that they both took the time to, 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 to put it together for me. So I was quite honored for it, yes. So, Sensei, your journey to becoming a tea master is really interesting. Um, so originally you are from Canada and That's you correct. came to Japan in the 80s to study Budo, but weren't you studying Kung Fu in Hong Kong before that? Yes, I was. Yeah. Uh, I, my in Canada, I was doing a little bit of uh, martial arts. I was kickboxing and things like that, and uh, taekwondo and some Wing Chun originally brought me to to Hong okay. Kong with a friend of mine. So we went to Hong Kong. He was actually a Chinese fellow that was being introduced to his wife to be. So he said he's going to Hong Kong. I said, "Okay, I'll go with you." And so he uh, left, and I went with him, and just kind of never went back. I went back to Canada a couple of times in the interim, but I started doing Kung Fu in Hong Kong. And then about eight, I don't know, eight, 10 years, I can't remember. Uh, it was probably my age and my understanding of things. I wasn't really satisfied with the way my, my uh, Kung Fu was progressing. So I wanted to find something a little bit more with a path, Michi, <laughs> the way. Yes. And so any, any of the Japanese martial arts had a very, easy to understand they usually end it with the, the Chinese character for path or way meaning do so originally I wanted to come to Japan to study kendo and then uh iaido iaido yeah. being the art of drawing the sword and kendo of course using the sword and so I left Hong Kong to come to Japan to study the, the martial arts and uh I can't remember the exact year 84 85 something like that so I, I know you studied um several including kendo kudo which is archery as you mentioned yes. uh, yaido sword drawing and i had i had a student who uh, taught me some yaido so that was really oh, interesting yes. for me and yeah. um you also did um naginata which naginata yes i did naginata it's a uh, it's similar to a halberd uh, it's a long pole with a blade affixed to it it was often used by the foot soldiers and uh, more uh, recently in Japanese history, it's a weapon that's attributed to the women of the warrior families. Uh, it's something that they would use to defend their homes and things like that. And uh, the traditions, again, there are many schools. Um, I was doing Jikishin Kage Ryu of, of the uh, Naginata tradition. And uh, so these traditions are, unlike a lot of the most of the martial arts are run by men these traditions are run by women uh, and so kind of interesting uh, to see how it has progressed through that and i did another style called nito ryu which is the two sword style same as musashi uh, yeah and so how, how long did you study and how proficient did you become at these various uh, japanese martial arts uh, proficiency might not be the adequate word but uh, i studied <laughs> for quite a long time uh, I, in, uh, the two sword style, uh, me told you I was a Rokudan, a Renshi Rokudan, which is a first, first level instructor with a sixth degree. Oh, wow. And then in Iairo, in, uh, Tamiya Ryu, I was, a uh, first Godan, uh, Renshi Godan, which is, uh, a fifth degree with the first level instructor. And then in Kudo, I was a, a Godan, which is a fifth degree. Uh, and then the other ones, I kind of forget. I'm thinking somewhere third degree, second degree. So I probably have about 25 degrees of black belts. <laughs> you sound like the ultimate martial artist. I mean, that, that sounds like, like a, a lot of levels of proficiency there. And then, nah. then obviously, uh, yeah, I'll continue, sorry. No, I was just going to say that's that's pretty much in the past. Now I'm just a fat okay. old tea, tea guy. <laughs> oh, well, we all have to slow down and enjoy life. And yeah, so that, I guess that leads to the, this idea of, at some stage, you wanted to connect um, more culturally, 
or you wanted to connect your martial arts training to to Japanese culture. And uh, initially, you tried learning um, koto, which my That's wife correct. wife plays, and also um, calligraphy. Mm-hmm. And you yes. sounded like you struggled with those two. Yeah, I always tell the story of well, even when I was in Hong Kong, when I was doing kung fu and things like that, I learned a phrase. Uh, in Japanese, we say bun buryodo, which is the martial bun, not bun. It's the culture of martial ways together in unison. Kind of like the American military concept of an officer and a gentleman. I see. You don't want to just be a thug and beat somebody. You want to beat them artistically. So you need that kind of a, a balance <laughs> to it. And so um, when I first came here, as you just, uh, or as I just mentioned, and you knew was that I did a lot of martial arts, but I felt kind of a... Uh, an imbalance in my yin and yang, so to speak. Uh, I needed some kind of balance. So I wanted to live my life in this boom, boo, style. So I wanted to balance my martial side with something cultural. And as you mentioned, I tried calligraphy and uh, um, the okoto, which is a Japanese harp for those that don't understand it. Long plank of wood with strings on it. And apparently I had no talent for either. And so that's what led me to the tea. Actually, that's not true. I was doing tea at the same time. I kind of picked them all up at around the same time, oh, probably okay. within six months of coming to Japan, I was doing everything, which was probably a problem because I was doing too much. Oh, wow. That's probably why I couldn't focus so much. But um, yeah, so I, like I said, I needed to balance that martial side with the cultural side. So I was looking for something to do culture and that ultimately led me to the way of tea. And am I right in saying it was your neighbor who was a, a, a tea, tea master or a tea teacher? Yes. Yes, yes exactly. A uh, very special woman. Uh, she's turning 100 years old in August. Oh, my goodness. Good yes, and still very, very genki or energetic, as we say in Japanese. <laughs> she's a lovely lady. I dedicated my book to her and my previous sensei, or not previous, but current sensei that has passed away. And so, um, at any rate, uh, because of her, uh, I will say that I'm still here today. Uh, I studied with her originally. Uh, let's call it a passive study, if you would. It's not something I was doing as much as I was doing the martial arts. It was just kind of there as a balance. And then, like I said, I was building my, as you mentioned, proficiency uh, in the martial arts. And so, tea was just kind of a, a passive hobby. Until I got to a certain level in my martial skills, I thought, okay, this is I feel confident in what I'm doing now. So what I want to do is bring my T level up to the same level. And so um, the plan was 10 years martial arts, 10 years T and then 10 years together. But that kind of fell to the wayside. And now it's martial arts is a hobby and T is what I do. And so uh, I studied, like I said, with her passively. And then I made the choice to join this the school that I mentioned earlier, this Urusenke uh, Technical College, the Urusenke Senmongako. And uh, from that time on, uh, I don't want to say I took it more seriously, but it was more of a focus. focus. Not like I wasn't serious before. Okay, so you received a, I think it's called a Midorikai program from that Urusenke Gakuen Professional College. And that was a three-year scholarship? It's not anymore. No, um, my situation was a bit different. At that time, they were still accepting uh, students for a three-year program, but uh, very few people go through the three-year program. And um, I received, how do I say this? My application was made from Japan. I wasn't recommended by a branch from overseas to come to Japan to study. So the people that come from overseas, they're put up in a a dormitory and they get uh, a stipend and uh, everything is paid for them. I paid basically for myself, uh, my transportation, my housing and everything like that. Of course, the grand team master was gracious enough to, to give me the scholarship for the, the actual school fee. And so that was quite helpful. And so I, like I, I joined the Midori Kai program and I, if I'm not mistaken, I was the last person to go through the three year program and then they cut it down to one. And that's only and offered to foreign foreigners. That's yes. Program. Yeah. Oh, so it's only one year now. Yeah, it's only one year with a special uh, introduction of having a one-year hiatus and going back and doing another year. I mean, it could be case by case, and there could be various changes that I'm not aware of, but uh, that's what I'm familiar with of late. 
And so I do know people that have come here for a year, studied, and then gone back to their particular branches and assisted with them for a year and then were recommended again to come back for another year. So you could do two years theoretically. And then in 1999, you received your Chame. Um, That's correct. You received. And then in 2011, you became a fully licensed teacher. And so obviously that became a, a goal for you. At what, what stage did that become a goal to become a, a tea master? Um, in 2011, I'm guessing you're referring to my Jun Kyoju. Uh, assistant, what does it say in the information that you have? The assistant professorship? Oh, it's, uh, I think it was on Japanology Plus. It mentioned that in 2011, you became a fully licensed teacher. Actually, I was a fully licensed teacher when I graduated. Okay. I had the first level teaching degree and then I got the second level teaching degree. I'm, I'm guessing that in 2011, maybe it was my, uh, let me just actually check. Mm -hmm. It might be in my book can't remember to be honest but what it would be is the levels 2011 yeah that would be about right so that would have been my associate professorship and then uh i received my my um full professorship as well yep. past that i don't remember the exact year i'd have to look it up and so um I, like i said when i graduated i was a, a teacher and then the chame the chame is not related to, to being a teacher, but you have to be at that level to be able to receive your chame. There are two uh, teaching certificates that we call hikitsugi and seihikitsugi. And these, these are the licenses that allow you to teach. And then beyond that, the chame is for due diligence, I guess you could say. And then beyond that, you have licenses that, that uh, allow you to do more within the framework of the school as far as your students go. So okay. like a lot of people will do tea without having the thought to become a professor of tea or to do tea professionally, if you would, or to actually even teach tea. A lot of people that are doing tea are just doing it for themselves as a hobby or something like that. Okay. So some people would, would be satisfied once they've received their chame and they exactly. might do something, do these uh, way of tea experiences for their, their friends. Yes. At their home. Yep. Maybe they have a, a tea room yep. in their house, but yep, you actually, like yeah, you, you teach tea, I mean, the way of tea at university. And so you're teaching, I guess, Japanese students and yes. foreign students. Yes. My university course is actually a little bit interesting. It was recommended uh, to me through the, the current Grand Tea Master, Zabosai, the 16th generation Grand Tea Master. The University of Doshisha was looking for an instructor, and he recommended me. And it's for the program at Doshisha called ILA, which is the International Liberal Arts Program. And what it is, is it's a, a course that I teach in English. It's a two credit course with 15 lessons. And uh, I teach the academic side. Of course, it's just, as it's only 15 lessons, it's very brief as far as academics go. And of course, you know, each aspect of tea could be a lifelong study for anybody. But what I do is I put more of an emphasis on the hands-on side of it. So what I do is I try to teach the students in that uh, semester, how to actually serve a bowl of tea properly using a small procedure that we refer to as bonya. It's an abbreviated uh, procedure of uh, serving of the thin tea. And so in that instance, I teach um, the students at that university. I have taught at other universities. Uh, I often lecture like a one-off lectures all over, all over the country, to be perfectly honest. And uh, in that instance, it's just kind of, basically talking about what we're talking today is just an introduction about myself and how things are going and connection of parts and things like that. I understand. So that, let's get into something we've briefly touched on in our emails and, and you've mentioned a few times already is the, the spirit of chatter can be expressed in a, a four character word, which is what K say Jaku. Um, it's a fascinating word. Um, the wa means peace, the, the k means uh, respect, the sa means purity, and the, the jaku means tranquility. Tranquil. And the, these are elements that you strongly or are strongly related to um, the way of tea and, and the experience. Yes. So I guess in a way, are people 
trying to achieve Jaku through the experience of the wave T? Probably in an ideal situation, yes, that's the state that you would like to get to. But it's something that you should probably, hopefully, say, for example, you mentioned a formal gathering of tea. Through these three walk case, say, these three harmony, respect, purity, you should be able to achieve, even in that one instance, a form of tranquility. So it's not, it's not like, say, for example, you're wanting to achieve satori, which yes. is enlightenment. Uh, so, I mean, of course, tranquility, enlightenment, they're kind of probably at some point connected not in the same instance, not in the same, the same goal, I would say. These are things that we should experience on a daily basis. Mm. I guess people experience satori in that as well. And of course, there are different degrees of satori and there are different degrees of tranquility, but definitely something that uh, you would strive for. I mean, I guess if we can be present in, in the moment and we, we, uh, we can hear the sound of the water and the, the, the touch of the bamboo ladle, and if we're present enough, I guess we have these little touches of tranquility. But, yeah, I think it's very hard to say, oh, I'm going to go in there and be tranquil for the whole experience. That's, that's just not right. realistic. No, it's not. I mean, and, of course, each person is different in what they would achieve or in what they would envision tranquil to be. And so um, it's just something, I mean, actually in Japanese, the character is more commonly referred to as samishi meaning lonely, lonely. Mm. but, but that's not, you know, not what we're doing it here. I mean, maybe alone might be an instance, but it's not lonely. And so the, the, um, each person, like I said, they will have a different experience as to what will bring them into a tranquil state. And so in that instance, um, it's uh, a lot more personal, I would say. There are, there are two other words uh, I've discovered through, um, researching you, Sensei, and that's Zanshin and Mushin. And again, they are related to tea. And I believe Zanshin is also related to um, martial arts. As is Mushin. Okay. Yes. Um, these are very, uh, for me, Zanshin was one of the most powerful phrases when I was doing martial arts. Um, I refer to it in a very simplistic way as uh, situational awareness meaning that if I'm fighting somebody and I knock them down or if I'm doing EI, done EI, so you know what the sanction is, you make your cut and then you assess that. You make, you're not just going to put your blade away and walk away. You want to make sure that your, your opponent is actually down and done. <laughs> you know, <Finished. laughs> he's not going to get back up and knock you in the back of the head when you're not looking. Hmm. And so uh, this, this kind of uh, situational awareness or this awareness is very important uh, in T, I kind of describe it. It's a little bit different. The actual two Chinese characters for that is uh, nokori no kokoro, uh, lingering heart for mm. an English explanation. The leftover, if you would, <laughs> uh, zan is so it's leftover heart. And uh, there is one phrase in the poems of the 100 poems of Rikyu where it states that we should. Um, not like say for example if i'm uh, this is probably kind of out of my book is if i'm wiping the container that holds the tea that process is not finished after i'm finished wiping i have to put the the piece down and then i have to pay attention to where i'm going next so i'm not just okay that's done next 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 there has to be a, a element of a flow to it and so the in the the way of tea in these 100 poems of viku there's one poem that says that when you release an item you should be like releasing your hand from the face of a, a lover that you're not going to meet for a long time. So you're not just going to go take it away. You know, you're going to, it's going to be more of a, a lingering, I understand. your lingering heart, your lingering heart, if you would. That's a, and so that's a beautiful, I was just going to say, that's a beautiful way to frame it. Yes. Uh, it, it struck me quite, uh, very interesting. Actually, one of the other YouTube videos that I recommended to you was where Peter was being hosted by uh, Yamamoto Sensei, and there's a there's a part in in that video where Yamamoto Sensei puts out the tea bowl for Peter, and when he releases his hand from the tea bowl, it just floored me. It was just so elegant. It was just so. It was just exactly what I talked about. You could just see that zanshin, mm. 
Mm. It was, and I, I'm to this day, I'm trying to duplicate that from Yamamoto Sensei, but <laughs> I, I don't, I don't quite have it. But yeah, so that was that was quite quite nice the way that he just, you know, it looked like it was slow motion, but it wasn't. It was just, it was just, it wasn't like he just put it down and then let go. You know, it was just it was, it was very elegant. The movement was very elegant. Lots of heart. I did actually notice the movements of of um, the the tea master and also the guests. And one guest, after he's taken a sip and he's slowly put the bowl down, he gets his right hand and kind of angles it down and, and puts it on his knee on top of his kimono. And I, I was thinking, is that a expression of gratitude he, or is he put the he put his what did he do? Say it again. So he, as he, he had a sip, right? He put the bowl down because I think he was he was going to share it. So he had to yes, it would have been a thick tea. Yeah. For the next person, but as he did that, his right hand was almost pointed down like that on an angle, mm -hmm. and on top of his right knee. Um, and I was it looked so precise and purposeful. Was he still holding the ball? He, like I, I'm not sure. So, I'll have to go back. But there was. I guess uh, the point it, is, what happens there is, if I, if I can inject there, what he had, it, what would happen probably is he took a sip, and then the host would have asked him how was the tea, and so then he takes his right hand down to bow, and puts it down in front of him, and he bows to the host, and he says it was very nice, thank mm -hmm. you. So when he's sipping, after he's made the first sip, the host will say, How is the tea? And he would take that and bow to the host and say, Keiko this. I think he, yeah, I think you're right. He bowed. Maybe they removed the audio. But yeah, uh, quite probably they were having a talk over it. Like yeah, that. It was, it was but that's definite, normally what happens. Yeah. So there's this elegance of movements. Uh, but I, I was thinking, you know, if I, if I were to describe uh, the way of tea or what we, you know, what is described as a tea ceremony, I was thinking you'd, you'd describe it as sort of precision in action and, and subtlety in communication. Very, very much so. Very good. Uh, yes. And there's a lot of silent communication as well. You know, like I said, um, this, this sound of the guest drinking the tea, the host isn't watching him. He's sitting away, looking away. So when he hears the first sip of the, the host, then he would know to ask. So it's this silent, nonverbal communication, if you would. And so this this uh, plays into the elegance of the the gathering as well. And so you know it's this this sign of respect and harmony and purity they all play into to each part of it. And, and so it uh, definitely uh, the way you uh, explain it is fine. It's very a good way to talk about it. And then uh, getting back to your other term, which was uh, mushin. Mushin. Mm. Okay. Again, the the previous one was zanshin. Next one's mushin. So shin means heart in Japanese kokoro. So zanshin, leftover heart. Mushin means no heart. Yes. Mm. But it doesn't mean cold-hearted or no-hearted like that. It's a totally different concept. It means to – I actually translate it in my book as in the groove. Yeah, I like, like that something, translation. Yeah. Some, something that uh, – you do unconsciously it's something that you've done many times repetitively and then you just kind of takes you over and you're doing it. You're in the groove, like people that are running sprinters and things like this, they get into a, you know, you just, you know it, you're doing it. And sometimes you're on, sometimes you're off. And so when you're in the groove, you can actually kind of know when you're in the groove and you can feel it easier. And so what it means is to be able to, in the martial arts, I would, I would parry you without thought or I would hit you without thought. So it's kind of like, and it doesn't mean not thinking. They have another phrase for, for no thought in Muso, but that's a different different uh, idea, idea. So Mushin just means to be able to to do something naturally without uh, being present in the thought, so to speak. Mm. So is, it, is it similar to a flow state, being in flow? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. In flow, in the groove, sim very similar to, to that, I would say. So, so I... I, I I think I'm sort of wondering where we should go because um, that, that's, I think my audience won't know that for some guests, there is an mm -hmm. experience called Chaji, which is yes. a, a, like a two hour um, way of tea experience where the guests. That would be a very short one. Oh, is that the, oh, that would be, a, okay, really? Gee, no, no. Okay. The, the Chaji is probably you're looking at 
if it's very, very well done and there's no happenings, uh, uh, three hours would probably be minimum for two guests, three guests. If it, and if you have five guests, it's going to be a bit more. We have several varieties of chajis. I'm actually glad you brought it up because um, I said we're doing the way of tea. At the heart of tea is this uh, chaji, this, this uh, formal gathering of tea. But I'll be honest, most people don't know that there is a formal gathering of tea, even Japanese people. If I show them the two Chinese characters for chaji, meaning cha or tea and thing, right? Tea thing, if you would, would be the direct literal translation. The majority of people wouldn't understand it. They would understand each word individually, but you put it together, they couldn't get it. They couldn't envision what you were talking about. And then if I was to say the informal gathering, which is cha kai, uh, tea meeting, Yes. then they would have a, they would be able to understand immediately what you're talking about. Okay. And so this chaji lies at the heart of what we do at tea. And so when we study tea, we study to be able to perform this, this formal gathering. Uh, and so, but I'll be honest, the majority of people that are studying tea will never do it in their lifetime, either as a guest or a, for sure not as a host, I see. Uh, which is sad. But uh, it's very, uh, like you notice, it's a three, four hour procedure. And to be honest, that's only the actual procedure, the setup and the takedown. And then, you know, the preparations and things like that take a long, long time. And so it's a little bit uh, different. But if you would like, I could walk, verbally talk you through what a formal procedure would be. Please do. But, um, in a before, nutshell. Yeah, before you do, I just wanted to say for our audience that the, the people who would experience, the, the, the guests of a Chachi would, would have a, a pretty sound knowledge and experience of the way of tea so that they could actually you know, yes. probably be involved or participate in a chaji. Without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, you could, as an absolute beginner, attend one, but it would be, it would, it would throw the wall off. Yeah, it would be, the harmony would be gone. But I mean, I have done them for beginners in a teaching instance where I teach the the formal gathering, or I've actually even hosted them for beginners, knowing that it would be more of a an experience than an actual formal thing. Mm. And so, yes, it takes a lot of work to be able to do it as first a guest and then as a host. And so there are a lot, you have to learn your lines for each individual uh, thing that's happening. Uh, the It's very much like interactive stage. If we go that way, Okay. it's like you have your lines. I have my lines. It's divided into the first act, the intermission and the final act in the first act you would be really there'd be a laying of charcoal and a, a serving of uh, the kaiseki meal, which is the traditional Japanese meal. And then there would be serving of sweets. And then after that, you would uh, leave the tea room and then take your intermission. The host wouldn't get a break. He has to roll up the scroll, wipe out the room, dust it down, put in flowers, and then call the people back into the tea room to prepare tea in the second seating. There would be a serving of the thick tea and a serving of the thin tea with a, a laying of the charcoal in between. That's it in a very, very uh, nutshell. I can go into much more detail if you want. But. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll link to the uh, Japanology. Definitely. Japanology. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, what astounded me was the koicha, that, that thick matcha um, that they serve and yes. how the preceding meal is is to prepare the the stomach because stomach it's so, yes, exactly. so thick um so I, I'd, I'd definitely like to try um koicha i mentioned earlier that the chaji lies at the heart of studying the way of tea at the heart of the chaji is the sharing of a bowl of koicha and so uh koicha for your listeners is very very much like green ketchup <laughs> it's very rich it's very viscous it's very thick actually i've been using a uh, probably a little bit more like a heavy cream before you whip it. That's the viscosity of it. And so uh, it's, of course, it is matcha, so it's very good for you. And it's matcha being the purest form of tea that you can get because there's nothing done to it. There's no form of uh, fermentation, oxidization, anything like that. And we're drinking the actual powder of the leaf itself. So it's a lot more min minerally and uh, nutritionally better for you, they say. But the koicha definitely is uh, a little bit special. And in this time of the COVID-19, we're having to rethink that because previously, as you mentioned, you have to share this bowl. Yeah, yeah. And so okay. we drink it. I drink my portion, I wipe it, and then I pass it from hand to hand. So even our grantee master is very conscious of this situation. And he is actually 
canceled all our lectures and lessons and things like this. And he, even prior to that, in the build up to it, he start, he stopped doing the thick tea. He said, you can do a thick tea in its uh, presentation, but when you serve, serve thin, thin tea. You can put your utensils up as a thick tea, but uh, please serve each person individually. And so we're paying attention to that now. And after this, I really don't know where it's going to go because right now I'm in limbo. I don't have any work uh, outside of the podcast. And uh, uh, so actually the, the university also is online just like we're doing right now. Um, and so it's very interesting in a sad way that we were not able to share these things in a more personal level, which is really lies at the heart of what tea is. But again, having said that though, to be able to do this, what we're doing right now is, is sharing this moment that you were talking about earlier that makes it a special moment. And there is another phrase in Japanese called Ichigo Ichie. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a, a phrase that's translated in many different ways. Uh, once in a chance opportunity, once in a lifetime meeting, something like that. I often use the, the phrase Kodak moment. Oh, yeah. Just that's a good way to say it, yeah. We, we, that's it. You know, if, even if you come back tomorrow, we do this again. I wear the same kimono. We wear the same thing, sit in the same place. We're not going to be able to, to recreate what we were experiencing no. today or what we're sharing today. And so this moment, this, this phrase of living and enjoying the moment is quite prominent through, throughout the way of tea as well. That was, yeah, that was actually one of the first um, phrases I learned uh, when I went to Japan for the first mm-hmm. time uh, with my hosts. And it was also used, you may even remember this, it was used as a, a slogan for the movie Forrest Gump. Yes. yes. And that was their, the, I think that was the name that they, it was the, actually what they used in the title when they gave the Japanese title of the name. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, think, I thought it was appropriate for that movie. Um, yeah. But, yeah, matcha, just to touch on matcha again and how it's different to um, yokucha, I guess, regular green chi, it's it's – it's the whole leaf, isn't it? It's it's not the, yes, it is. And it's so um, powder form. As you pro- yeah, as you're probably oh. aware, all tea comes from the same plant. All tea, the uh, oolong cha, Earl Grey, Pico, English breakfast, jasmine, kua, they all come from the same plant. It's just the processing that d- differentiates what they're going to become. And so the reason I said earlier that the matcha is the, the most or the purest form of tea is that there's nothing done to it. Uh, the, the fields are actually shaded in April to starve the light, to make the plant strive for more sunlight, which increases the chlorophyll and tiny and things like this. And so it's uh, uh, the gyokuro also, they shade the fields. I'm not, I'm not really an expert. I'll do, I do have my own line of tea. I'm not what I would consider myself an expert. But the uh, way of tea we use, of course, only matcha. There is the thick tea and the thin tea that I went over. And so these would be separated by the growers. Okay, this is a, these, these leaves are suitable for thick tea. These leaves are suitable for thin tea. Um, you hear all sorts of nonsense overseas about uh, ceremonial grade tea and things like that. Yeah, cooking tea. Of course, there are. But, I mean, basically it's matcha. You have two kinds of matcha. You have thick tea, thin tea matcha. And then if you want to go, we could say, okay, you could use this tea for cooking or that tea for something else. I In my shop here, I use... Uh, my own regular matcha that I produce in Kyotanabe, which is just out of south of Kyoto. I have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, four varieties of each, the thick tea and the thin tea. And um, these teas are, uh, like I said, sometimes used for baking, sometimes used for drinks, but you, you just have to go with the taste. I mean, it does, is, the, is the tea too overpowering? Then use something less lesser quality because you want to be able to maintain the tea taste. That's what happens sometimes when they use different varieties of teas. They, they get a green color, but they don't get a tea taste. It's really kind of strange sometimes. But yes, so the matcha is, is the powdered leaf. What happens is we cover the fields, as I said, and then in May we pick the leaves and they're taken directly from the plantation, or I'm sorry, from the fields to the plantation where they're, they're steamed. And what that does is, is kind of retards the oxidization because, of course, once you cut, they start to oxidize. And so once they're steamed, we run them through a fine uh, an oven to dry them out. So they're steamed, they're picked, steamed, dried. And then these leaves, we call them tencha. Uh, these leaves are kept until they're kneaded and then they're ground into a fine powder. And so, like I mentioned earlier, you're drinking the whole powder, not the infusion of the leaves, and then throwing the leaves away. It's the whole yeah. leaf itself. But the tencha 
if you do the tencha in the same fashion without grinding it and you serve it as you would say for example rokucha or something that's very very nice it has very sweet nice uh uh amami a sweetness to it Mm -hmm. so uh quite nice even if you cold drip it it's very nice as well just to go back to the um, thick tea and thin tea, so I, I made the assumption that thick tea was just more matcha with the water or with the with the hot water. So is there a difference in? There is a difference in the the plantation would select different leaves that they would consider proper for for thick tea. Okay. At the end of the day, there it is the amount of tea. Right. You can make thick tea with thin tea. Depending on the quality of the thin tea, it might not taste so good. But having said that, using the thick tea for the thin tea is very luxurious. When I was at school, whenever we would serve the sensei bowl of tea, we would use the thick tea but make it in the thin tea fashion with lots of bubbles. Looks like a matcha cappuccino or something like that. <laughs> but they have them here, so actually, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure. You, you haven't been out of Japan, but um, you wouldn't believe the kind of um, coffees or teas or matcha lattes you can get I've now. seen quite a bit on <laughs> online that makes me want to gag, but yeah, there pumpkin, is quite a bit. Pumpkin latte and oh, nice. rhubarb latte. Um, let, let's let's talk about your book. So, um, as yeah. you know, I've ordered your book, and I've I actually found Sorry, out it yeah. actually hasn't been dispatched. So, for some reason, there's been a big delay with um, Amazon Japan dispatching overseas. So, it might might be a few <laughs> more months before I get it. Ah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Wouldn't hope it takes that long. Yeah, I'm I'm quite eager to read it. So the the book is called the Book of Cha No Yu, mm-hmm. and the subtitle is the the Master Key to Japanese Culture. Yes, T the Master Key to Japanese Culture. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so what I, I was going to ask how, how can we get an insight to Japanese culture through the way of tea? Well, the like I mentioned earlier the. The cultural arts and tea kind of they've elevated themselves together. So a lot of the, um, if we go back, uh, I didn't mention this yet, but it's quite prominent. This term omotenashi. Mm. So what it means is hospitality, for lack of a better uh, word. And so of course every culture has hospitality. They just show it in different ways. So this this art of hospitality that they talk about today in Japan has a lot of its roots in the way of tea. So a lot of people are doing things that are based on the way of tea that they're not even conscious of uh, uh, in, in the way they handle things and the way they, they uh, react with people and things like that. And so through the various arts, what I'm talking about in the book is actual arts like, uh, you know, like I mentioned, calligraphy, ironworks, pottery, lacquerware, things like that. And so these, the, the, um, the heart of it would be in this omotenashi, which is where you would find the people coming in contact with the, the different kind of cultural arts that are present in the way of tea. Uh, we have what we refer to in, in Japanese as the Senkei Jushoku, which are the 10 craft families of the San Senkei, the three Sen families, the 10 craft, the 10 craft families of the three Sen families. So the three Sen families are Omote Senke, Ura Senke, Mushin, Okoji Senke. These are the three prominent uh, tea families, uh, tea, the way of tea families, if you would. Mm-hmm. And so we have people that are responsible for, like if you see my scroll behind me, you can see it's been mounted. So we have a person that's responsible for mounting scrolls. Um, if I was to show you a, a tea scoop like this, we have people that are, are uh, responsible for making things out of bamboo. We have metal uh, people that are working on metallurgy, people that are um, in iron and things like that, and people that are using making ceramics, uh, lacquerware. Um, uh, there's one called Ikambari, which is kind of like a paper mache, I guess, for lack of a better description. Um, things like that, and so these ten craft families in a in a formal gathering, even in an informal gathering, you will see items that are maybe not from these families, but that are in that field of, of uh, artistic uh, pieces, if you would, art pieces. I was, I was going to say, uh, omotenashi is another word that's it's kind of lost in translation. A, a lot of people relate it to, you know, this incredible Japanese service. Um, but I, I've learned, again, from you that, it, again, it's this more interaction between either two people or 
I guess even a person and, and objects. Right. Uh, rather yeah, than uh, just customer service. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, though, a lot of people, even in Japan here, are using it as customer service. Okay. So multinational, multinational. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of at odds with it because every culture on earth has hospitality. You know, there's not just one culture that has a whole thing on it, but just the way that it's portrayed or the way that it's done may be a little bit unique to different different cultures for sure. And so uh, the question of service is is uh, something that's very strong in Japan, but sometimes their service is not as good as it should be. There's a lot of things that I'm not, that I would, if you're working in my restaurant and you're doing that in the West, I'd fire you. You know, uh, I don't, their, their service is not quite what everybody seems to think it is at many levels. I mean, that's just the same everywhere. I mean, you have certain places that handle their service in different, different ways to, to other places. And so some of these omotenashi, oftentimes when I give lectures, like I mentioned earlier, I'll give a lecture for tea people and I'll ask them, okay, besides tea, what kind of, what do you imagine in Japan is very representative of this omotenashi culture? is this hospitality culture and they often struck for a, a definitive answer. And the one that I use really that is really quite strong is the ryokan, oh, yes. Japanese style inns. They're very, very strong with their handling of their guests and very, very uh, uh, focused on it a lot more so than many restaurants for sure. And so the, the, the hotels and uh, things like that will have a certain level of it, but the, the ryokan seem to elevate that level of hospitality. And again, this focus on guest to guest, uh, host to guest, and this interaction, a lot of it stems from the way of tea, I believe. Sensei, so we've been talking for an hour, and I, I do have um, two more questions I'd like to end okay. with. So outside of tea, as a tea master, outside of your work, um, and also the, the many years you've practiced um, the way of tea, has it helped you become more aware and patient and compassionate just outside in everyday life? I would like to think so, but my students might not think that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's definitely developed my sense of natural awareness um, and uh, interaction with people for sure. Uh, I, I, I want to say that it's through the way of tea, but I'm guessing it's also as you get older, things kind of change. And so blending together that, yes, there must be some form of me being a little bit more rounded than I was when I was younger, being very jagged, if you would. And so, um, yeah, I would like to think that I have a little bit more uh, calm serenity in me than, than I would have previously. Maybe that's just my testosterone going away. <laughs> Maybe. But, yeah, there is... Uh... I mentioned this now. There is footage of you being quite, quite strict as as a teacher of um, the way of tea. And, yeah, and I I imagine that's because you have high standards of yourself, and so I guess mm. when people do yeah, have I, high standards I, of themselves, they they tend to have that of their students. I would hope that's the way it is. In Japanese, mm. uh, we call it ainomuchi, ainomuchi, yeah. which is the whip of love. <laughs> so I'm. I'm I'm getting on them like that. But yeah, um, like I said to Peter, I could probably deal with some anger management courses sometimes. <laughs> but I, oh, even then, okay. I'm, I'm probably going a little bit lower than what I used to do. I used to scream at people fairly oh, wow. badly. <laughs> so, and, and it's at the end of the day, it's really stupid. I know that, but still. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, um, yeah, we've all got work to our own work to do, I guess. Yeah, we do. We do. And finally, you describe Japanese culture as a world treasure that everyone can yes. enjoy. And uh, yes, I, exactly. I'm in agreement with you. Um, but what, what makes you believe that just being in Japan for so long and realizing there's so much to, to learn from Japanese culture or is it something else? Oh, yes, that for sure. But also the expressed interest of people from overseas in Japanese culture. Mm. Like, of course, I'm in Kyoto, and up until just recently, it was the Mecca for tourists. And uh, there were many people from all over the world would come, and, you know, they're all of them expressing this interest. A lot of people come to Japan. Uh, Kyoto, of course, is it's interesting, though. I mean, a lot of people see Japan as this cultural, uh, historical enclave, but 
really, Kyoto is a very forward-looking city. A lot of the people in, in Kyoto are, are it's, it's not like it's culture. Even if we take the tea ceremony, for example, um, back in Miku's time, it wasn't a historical traditional thing. It was something that was new and avant-garde. And so the, the Kyoto people are always looking to things to the future and to the forwards. And so, but the, the culture of it is something that has been developed or the tradition of it is something that developed over the centuries. And so, of course, to protect that tradition, we have the grantee masters and the families that are protecting the tradition. But even then, we're looking forward. Like I said, in 1872, we developed this table for foreigners. And so that was at the time probably, oh, what are you doing? You know, kind of avant-garde again there. So yes. it's, it's something that is taken into consideration. But I think that the... At the end of the day, the 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 spiritual, I don't like the word, but the philosophical side of Japanese culture appeals to a lot of people from different nations. And that's why uh, there's such a great appeal for it. And it's something that I find, um, of course, going in depth into it, I, I can experience it, it a bit more, but I can see the, the fascination with it for people that are just uh, uh, being introduced to it for the, for the first time. Sensei, I, I'm going to link to the, the two episodes of the TV show Japanology Plus. Also, oh, thank you very much. To your book, the, the book mm-hmm. of Channel Yu, which can be purchased online at Amazon. And your website, Ran Hotte. Yes. Um, and Hotte means that's the, is that the fat Buddha or is that the, the Buddha? Yes, exactly. It's yeah. the fat Buddha. It's interesting because. In the West, we refer to him as the fat Buddha, the laughing Buddha, the happy Buddha, the smiling Buddha, but he's not Buddha at all. Oh. Oh, wow. Buddha is a very gaunt, slender man. Uh, <laughs> it's not the Buddha. He's he's the incarnation of the future Buddha. The future. And so it's interesting that in the West, we refer to him as the Buddha, where he's not the Buddha at all. <laughs> Another mistake. Well, Sensei, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. I hope your enjoyers listen are your your enjoyers. I hope your listeners enjoy the, the podcast. I'm sure they will. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And if you're ever in Kyoto, please come by my shop. I do host uh, tea experiences. So once uh, we're finished this uh, thing that we're in now and we're in our new normal, we'll see what comes of it. Oh, I'll definitely I look forward to serving you a bowl of tea. Take care. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Ikigai Podcast. To download Ikigai worksheets, to take the Ikigai questionnaire, or to join the Ikigai tribe, please visit ikigaitribe.com.